I greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I invite you to stand that we can lift our hearts and our minds together in worship and praise the one who has extended his hand in grace to us and forgiven us so that we can also extend that grace to others. Let's sing together. whose transgression is covered, whose sin is covered. While I kept silence, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night Then I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not hide my iniquity. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and he forgave my guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all who are faithful offer prayer to you. At a time of distress, the rush of mighty waters shall not 
shall not return. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround, you surround me with glad, glad cries of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you the way you should go. I will count you with my eyes upon you. Do not be like a horse or a mule without understanding, whose temper must be curbed with bit and bridle. <laughs> bridle else it will not stay near you. Many are the torments of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds those who trust in you. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. It is the season of Easter. Like I said last week, it's so wonderful that we don't have to just celebrate one day. We get a whole 50 days to celebrate the resurrection, to feel that joy to see the beauty of the lilies around us, and to remember what exactly happened on the cross, what happened in the empty tomb, and in the time that Jesus was with his disciples in his resurrected form, that promise of new hope and new life that we have also for ourselves. Now it's also, we're coming to the end of our faith promise here. This is when we start to look at missions as a focus. And we start to think, we've been forgiven, so what's next? Where do we turn our attention now? Where can we share that beauty of new life and hope with others? Yesterday, we had a funeral for a beautiful woman who lived her faith fearlessly. She lived it out when God called her to go to Africa and Australia She went. She made huge sacrifices. And we heard all these stories about how all through her life, until her dying day, she was thinking about how to care for others. Her life and relationship with Christ just flowed out of her and spilled out like a a cup overflowing into the people around her. I came away from that service feeling like, I want to be like Carol Hunton. And when I see our flowers over here that are left over from her service, it reminds me, we're going to worship again in heaven with Carol again someday. But may her life be an inspiration to us as we're thinking about faith promise and what it means to live our faith and put actions behind our faith. That spilling out, that natural bubbling up out of a fountain, a deep well. Let Carol be one of our guides forward as we look at that light of a life. So with that, I want to offer you this blessing of peace because we're on this journey together. We are inspiring each other with our lives. We are living biographies of Christ. So let me offer you this peace so that we can share it with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let's celebrate this peace together.
Good morning, everybody. As you're making your way back to your seats, I uh, just wanted to introduce myself. I am uh, Pastor David. I am one of the pastors here. Uh, and uh, every week we join together um, through a common identity. Um, so would you just uh, confess that with me today? We are a family of believers broken by sin, bound together by God's love on a spirit-led journey through wholeness in Christ. Well, if you are a first-time guest with us today, we would just love to welcome you and just let you know that we have a Connect card in the pew in front of you that you can fill out with as much information as you feel comfortable. And in exchange, we would love to give you a free gift. A couple announcements we have coming up is Man Camp, uh, which is going to be May 31st through June 2nd. You can register for this event. It is now open. It is for teens, 13 and up. Um, and we are going to meet at Smithville Lake. You can stay for the nights, the, the nights, or you can drive in and fellowship with us there. You can also register on the Church Center app. Next, we have Joy Meadows. This is our workday event coming up this Saturday, April 20th. Um, it is a foster care support organization, and if you feel led, you can help, and um, it'll be from 9 a.m. to noon. You can contact Margie Schwartz for any information, um, and she can help you with that. Next, we have our church work day. This is in two weeks on Saturday, April 27th. We will be working on a laundry list of things to do around the church facility inside and outside. You can also sign up on the Church Center app or contact Pastor Scott. Uh, lastly, we've got a ton of lilies and palms. Please take them at the end of service today. We do not need them anymore. So, um, And uh, you can find any information on the Church Center app um, regarding church order, people directory, and Friday news, and so much more. Uh, we are going to have offering at this time, so ushers are invited forward, and um, after offering is done, children are welcomed to the back with Pastor Renee for Children's Church. Would you please join me in prayer? Gracious God, we acknowledge that you are Lord of the harvest. We praise you for the provisions and blessings you provide to us. Please receive these first fruits that you have blessed us with and that we may give it back to you, glorify it, and use it for your kingdom, we pray. Amen. Shelter KC has been serving the Kansas City community for more than seven decades. The nonprofit was founded in 1950 as a Kansas City Rescue Mission. Its founder, Dr. Jared Acock, then superintendent of the Kansas City District Church of the Nazarene, had experienced his own life-changing transformation. After many years of alcoholism and homelessness, Dr. Acock accepted Christ as his savior at the Union Rescue Mission in Los Angeles. Not only was his life changed forever, but his decision to turn his gratitude into service has meant thousands of others now have faith for a better future. At Shelter KC, hope and healing are more than just words of encouragement. Real life turnaround stories are part of our very DNA. From our founding to current day transformations taking place in the lives of the individuals we have the honor of serving. Each year, more than 1,500 men seek services at Shelter KC Men's Center. Annually, we provide an average of 88,000 meals and 36,000 nights of shelter. These services are integral, but they are just the beginning. Led by licensed counselors, ordained ministers, caseworkers, and others passionate about seeing transformed lives, the Men's Center offers short-term emergency shelter, long-term shelter, and a long-term recovery program. Shelter KC has utilized the same building for three decades. Not only is the space severely limited and poorly configured, 
The much-used look and feel of the facility doesn't communicate a sense of hope and healing. Support for transformations will allow Shelter KC to create an environment more conducive to extending our transformational programs. For the first time in our 70 years of service, we have the opportunity to create a facility that echoes the excellence of our programs and conveys our commitment to those we serve. Capital renovations and an expansion to increase our capacity to serve more men will take place in two phases. In phase one, the men's center renovations will create a welcoming, hospitable, dignified experience for guests and staff. Provide a variety of types of spaces to serve diverse individual needs. Support the whole person, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Most of all, demonstrate Christ's love by providing authentic support and life-giving rest. Creating a safe and inviting environment will amplify and reinforce Shelter KC's life-changing programs. Trauma-informed design, using colors, textures, and decor that soothes and supports healing may include elements that foster privacy and confidentiality, the absence of adverse stimuli and stressors, connectedness to nature, a greater sense of community and collaboration. In addition, the newly renovated facility will be just as appealing outside and inside. The new look will serve as an intentional counterbalance to any community concerns. In Phase 2, the Men's Center Expansion Project will allow Shelter KC to increase its capacity to serve more individuals at a higher level. Connect spaces and users across various buildings to encourage a sense of community and collaboration and provide a variety of new outdoor spaces. For 70 years, faithful partners have enabled us to meet the needs of thousands of individuals facing the challenging issues of homelessness. As we step out on faith once again, we ask for your support as we seek to increase our space expand our services and grow our partnerships to meet the ever-changing needs of those experiencing homelessness in Kansas City. Together, we can recognize the dignity and path of renewal for all our guests and seek to offer a better way to shelter through our Transformations Campaign. Nall Avenue has had an incredible relationship with Shelter KC over the years. Uh, lots of different people have come and gone throughout uh, participating in this ministry. And of course, uh, Leo or uh, Willie, uh, our own Willie, is an uh, active part of that and uh, uh, part of our congregation. So uh, today we have uh, the executive director, Eric Berger, with us, uh, Glenn McKnight introduced me to Eric uh, for the first time. He's been, in May, it'll be his fifth year as the executive director, and uh, uh, he just told me that he actually preached here uh, the first time he preached at any church in Kansas City coming out of COVID or right before it or right in the middle of it or something. So uh, whatever that is, we're, we're glad uh, Kevin is here. If you want to, uh, Eric is here, excuse me, come forward, please, and uh, give us some information today. Good morning. It's, it's good to be with you. Um, so let me just talk a little bit about the transformation um, campaign and then um, just share with you some of the visions and the tie-in um, that your church in specifically um, Glenn has with this. You know, one of the things that um, we went through a process during COVID because there was a lot of talk on whether there was a need for rescue missions anymore. The city said, you don't need them anymore. We'll just put everybody in motels. Um, they did that, it didn't work. 
Our number one referral right now is the city at Kansas City. Their outreach workers are bringing people every day to us. Why? Because I can give somebody a place to sleep, but that doesn't solve their, their underlying issues. When you look at the chronic homeless, there's going to be a couple of things that are happening. There's either going to be an undiagnosed mental health issue, there's either going to be a chronic health issue, or a substance abuse issue. That's the makeup of the chronic homeless. We've got people that are having temporary homelessness um, that don't fit into that group. But the core group that we serve at Shelter KC, known as the Kansas City Rescue Mission, from the beginning of time has been that chronic homeless group. And if life transformation doesn't happen, they're going to continue to be homeless. And so one of the things that we went through and said, what do we need to do to have our facilities relate to that? Because some of it was, we still were in a day where we were putting 100 people in the same room. And that doesn't fit if you have a mental health issue. That doesn't fit if you just came out of the hospital. And then one of the things that we determined is that we really needed to have more space for CCOR, Christian Community of Recovery. And so right now, we have already completed phase one. Um, if you ever want to come down for a tour, we'll be glad to show you. In phase one, we've now added a new mental health shelter. It's actually the first in the country in any rescue mission. We already have missions calling us repeatedly saying, tell us about it. And we're saying, yeah, well, let's figure it out a little bit more and we'll tell you more about it. We now have respite for people coming out of the hospital. And one of the things we had a guy who had a brain tumor, was in a camp for eight years in the throes of his addiction. He refused to go to a shelter. The hospital released him to a camp. It just happened to be the city worker was there and didn't give him a choice, said, you're coming to the mission, after he had just had a brain tumor taken out. He spent four days in our respite. And then he said, you know, I've had 30 days of sobriety. Maybe I should try this sober thing and is now in the Christian community of recovery. That's the bridge. And so that renovations have been done. The next phase is to add a new welcome center that will be named after Dr. Acock, who founded the mission who had once been homeless. But one of the other things is, many of you know Joe Clazy. We have the Joe Clazy Chapel right now, but it's not a dedicated worship space. It's really active. We sleep people in it, we feed people in it, and then we occasionally have chapel. As you saw on the slide, there'll be a new dedicated worship space. We believe that's important because sometimes the world wants to make us a housing organization. And one of our core values is that we're Christ-centered. And we want to make sure that we have a worship space that everything else we do is then built around that. So that'll be one of the things in the new building. But the second and third floor will be dedicated just to Christian recovery. And this was something that was really at the heart of Glenn's heart. Um, one of the things that many of you might know Glenn's story, but if those of you do not, um, the mission had to be forcefully moved from the city market to our current location. They were not given a choice. And there was a lot of work that needed to be done. So Glenn had volunteered as a brick mason to do the work for free. And he then met guys in the program and invited them to his recovery group. From there, then, he decided to go to college and became a certified alcohol and drug counselor and came to work for Shelter KC, then Kansas City Rescue Mission, mentoring and counseling men in addiction. Glenn would always tell me that he didn't think he had much impact. And then I'd meet all these people who would tell me what a spiritual father Glenn had been. When we were doing this campaign, we had made a decision that the third floor, the last slide, you saw a common area, kind of a living room area, that we would name after Glenn, and we would share this with him at his retirement. And we just didn't get to do that. Um, but, you know, that legacy is going to continue. The other thing that I want to just share with that legacy 
is Willie, who goes to this church. Glenn was his recovery coach. Willie is now working on his degree to become a certified chemical dependency counselor, the same degree that, that Glenn got. That's the legacy. And so, um, one of the things that we have the honor to do is to continue that legacy. We'll be naming the third floor. I'm going to give you an update about the project. Um, phase one is completely funded, paid for, and is open. And we still need to raise $1.4 million to complete the $5.2 million um, project. We've got to do that by December because some of that money is a match. And so pray as we do that. Um, but we hope to then, um, hopefully this, this spring, um, start, that con start that construction project for the phase, um, for the phase two. Um, it's really interesting. I talked a little bit about the city. The city doesn't know what to do with us because they cannot accept that, that, that Christ changes lives, but they can't deny that Christ changes lives because they love our results. And they kind of wink, wink, and they'll say things like, um, yeah, we'll just call it life transformation. I said, you can call it whatever you want. Just keep sending them. But we know why we exist. But one of the things is the population has changed. Um, when I first started working in missions, everybody was a 55-year-old alcoholic. Now we have so many 18, 19-year-old kids staying with us. There's a reason why we needed to upgrade our facilities. Our population has changed. The need for privacy, the need, you have folks that, man, you don't know what trauma they've had. And so that's what represents some of the things that we're doing. So we want to just let you know how much we appreciate your church's ongoing support. If you want to find out more about the campaign or what we're doing to honor um, Glenn and, and Glenn's Common, just come and talk to me after. And just thank you so much for your support of Shelter KC at Kansas City Rescue Mission. We can get behind this. We, we, we include Shelter KC on our faith promise giving, and that's like a couple grand. We can do better. Um, I, I love for us to, you know, maybe we can kind of commit to seven or 8,000. Could we commit at all to 10,000 to support the Glenn McKnight uh, room? I don't know. Uh, I've been told they just need the pledges in by the end of the year, but I think we should get our money into them by the end of the year as much as we can. So you can help us by, in the next few weeks, you'll be hearing more about Faith Promise committing there. You can always give to Shelter KC through the church. If you just mark your giving, Shelter KC will make sure they get it. Uh, and some of you may have want to individually kind of help them along uh, in the memory of uh, Glenn. So that'd be great. Thank you, Eric. He'll be in the back afterwards uh, to answer any of your questions. Let's continue in our worship. This is Isaiah 61, the year of the Lord's favor. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, 
a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the, the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations, and in their riches you will boast. Instead of your shame, you will, be, you will receive a double portion, and instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you, you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. In my faithfulness, I will reward my people and make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge that they are a people of the Lord, the Lord has blessed. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of his righteousness. As a bridegroom adores his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seed to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. This is the word of the Lord. Would you stand and sing with us?
yet by the love of God? I am. Well, this is a part of our service where we worship through prayer. You're welcome to be seated as we enter this time of prayer. This may be the most important part of our worship that we do today, most important work that we do here today. There's a number of people and things that you may be praying for that we're praying for. I just want to remind you and bring to your attention a few of those that we're aware of. We're thinking of Carmen Roberts today, recovering from a knee surgery. Uh, we're, we're praising God for Shelter KC and the, their work in our world in Kansas City. And we're praising God for Glenn McKnight. We're praying for Shelter KC, that God would bring those funds they need. We're praying for Joy Meadows and their work in the world as a foster support, foster and adopt support community and how we can help them. We're thinking of the Hunton family today and Jay, we're praying for Jay, we're, we're praying for all the Hunton extended family, and we're praying for Herky Fitzpatrick, and I don't know if you've heard the news spread yet this morning within the last hour, but one of our longtime members here, Mark Cozart, is at KU Hospital right now receiving a kidney transplant. So you know when those organs come available, there's not much time. So uh, we're grateful that they were able to get us that message here. And we want to do something special here. I, I want to invite our, our prayer volunteers if they go ahead and make their way down. But I wonder if there'd be one person who would stand in the gap for Mark this morning and make your way down and intercede for Mark. Just one person, whoever feels led by the Spirit now to come and we want to anoint you in Mark's place. Uh, Don's coming, and I know so many more of you uh, want to pray for Mark. And so uh, we want to invite you to come and lay your hand on the one being inter- anointed today on behalf of Mark over here at our anointing altar. You can come lay your hands on Don as he stands in the gap for Mark today. And, and just pray for Mark and pray for his kidney transplant and pray for the the family and the one whom this organ has come from. And let's give thanks to God this morning for that. And and you're welcome to join us at any place at the altar this morning. Come. I'd rather have Jesus Father, how we are overwhelmed by your love, your love that chases after us, that sends your only son into the world to show us how to live, show us how to be human, to die on a cross and conquer death and be raised again. Oh, how extravagant your love is. Some would call this reckless because how incredible it is. We are overwhelmed by your love today. We are overwhelmed by how you work among us and in your world and the signs of your work. We give you thanks and praise. We especially lift up 
our brother Mark Cozart this morning who received this last minute news that a kidney is available for him. And we, we have been burdened with Mark with the dialysis and what an impact on his life and his occupation and everything that this ailment has had. And we pray that he would find success in this transplant this morning. We pray for the doctors and the nurses and KU Hospital. And we give you thanks for them and their resources. And we think of the one who this organ came from. We don't know the circumstances around it, but we pray for that one and that family. We pray that you touch Mark's body that has been so weak for so long. May you give him new life today, new strength. May you touch him through the recovery process. May you just be in that place with him this morning, we pray. As he goes to sleep and wakes up with a new organ, may he know that his brothers and sisters are rooting for him, are cheering for him, are supporting him and uplifting him and, in fact, interceding for him just now. Would you honor these requests, we pray. We think of Carmen Roberts recovering from knee surgery. Would you give a special touch to that knee and any pain surrounding that knee? Would you bless her? Would you give her renewed life and a speedy recovery, we pray, from this knee surgery? Oh God, we're thankful for Glenn McKnight and what an impact he had. So humble, not thinking he could make a difference to anyone, but how he touched all of us who knew his story and so many experiencing recovery. We pray that that legacy continue as you work and grow and develop Willie Leopard, who will follow in the same path. We pray for Shelter KC that they would find success in this new building project and the Glenn McKnight Commons and so many other wonderful resources. We thank you how you are leading and guiding Shelter KC to be a leader among all shelters. We just pray that this work would continue. We thank you for the incredible opportunity to, for the city of Kansas City to recognize the work that Shelter KC is doing, which is just being the hands and feet of you, Jesus. Jesus, it's your shelter, and it's your people who are serving on your behalf. We just praise you and thank you for how your hands are working through there. We pray for the Hunton family today. Would you give a special touch to Reverend Jay Hunton this morning? What a sweet spirit. What a wonderful man of God who's lost his bride and who is dealing with that. We pray for the extended Hunton family, that you would give them peace. What a wonderful life lived by Carol Hunton and how she touched us all and her legacy continues. And Lord Herky Patrick, Fitzpatrick, would you uh, surround the Fitzpatrick family and extended family with strength and with compassion. And Lord Jesus, we just pray that you wreck us. Help us to understand what it means to be wrecked. Um, for you showed us that compassion is not just a feeling. Compassion is humbling ourselves, is lowering ourselves, is listening to the one in need, standing beside the one in need, walking those forward steps with the one in need, not coming with everything to give, but just to be. Would you give us that kind of wrecking compassion for our brother and sister, whom we, those whom we know and need and those whom we don't yet know and need. Lord Jesus, this is your church. We pray that you use an all avenue Church of the Nazarene and our brothers and sisters in Christ around the city and around the world and those serving in foreign lands and those indigenous persons serving right there and those lands that are foreign to us too. Oh God, would you renew our strength, we pray, through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And we join now, Lord Jesus, in the way that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm reminded today just how incredible it is that our Lord is able to bring together not just a time of listening to the word, but an entire season of worship. I'm blown away every time I'm up here and I just text Heather like three days before Sunday and say, I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to talk about this, this, and this. And then you show up on Sunday morning and man, the music set is just bit like... Um, chosen perfectly and cultivated in a way that is uplifting. And then today to have, of all days, to have uh, Shelter KC and share with us this wonderful news. And uh, I don't know about you, but as, as a Nazarene and as a member of the community of the Kansas City area, I feel very proud to see the work that they are doing to not only put people on cots, but to, to really understand their needs and to serve these people and it is i hope you'll hear how relevant that is to the word that we have today i'm going to start by reading you a couple of parables i'm going to begin with a modern parable uh, you probably won't be as familiar with it but you might have recognized recognize it here and then i'm going to be reading a f- several parables from um, the gospel today. So we're going to begin with this small parable. Once upon a time, in the hidden heart of France, a handsome young prince lived in a beautiful castle. And although he had everything his heart desired, the prince was selfish and unkind. He taxed the village to fill his castle with the most beautiful objects and his parties with the most beautiful people. One night, an unexpected person arrived at the castle seeking shelter from a big storm. She offered as a gift a single rose, but the prince was repulsed by her haggard appearance and turned the woman away. She warned him not to be deceived by appearances, for beauty is found within. When he dismissed her again, the outward appearance melted away to reveal a beautiful enchantress. The prince begged for forgiveness, but it was too late, for she had seen that there was no love in his heart. Now these are the words of Walt Disney. Hear now 
the words of our Lord. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed although they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God, one of those seated said. Jesus answered, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests at the time. He sent his servants to tell those who have been invited, Come, everything is now ready. But they all made excuses. I have just bought a field and must attend to it. I have just bought new yoke and oxen, and I need to try them. Please excuse me. I just have gotten married. I cannot come. The servant came back and reported this, and the owner of the house became angry and sent his servant, go out quickly to the streets and the alleyways. Bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Large crowds continued to travel Jesus, and he said, anyone who comes after me and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, even their own life. Such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. One who builds a tower, will you not sit down and estimate how much it will cost to see if you are able to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and aren't able to pay for it to finish, everyone who sees it will know you have failed and will show that you are in shame. But but a king who is going to war, will he not consider whether or not his army of 10,000 is able to oppose an army of 20,000? And after seeking counsel, when he, he realizes he will not, he sends a delegation and will ask for peace. So those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for soil nor for the manure pile. And that instead is thrown out. These are the words of our Lord, Jesus Christ, God. Today, I know I read a lot. But it's because I have been spending a lot of time with these words. These come from the Gospel of Luke, the 14th chapter. And I have been captivated by not just the stories that Jesus tells, but the stories that that Luke, the stories of Jesus that the author Luke groups together, and how that has been recently, as I've been reading Luke over and over, a new story has come to light because of the intentionality of the gospel writers. We hear stories today of who is invited and who will respond. Stories about, as we sang and heard, good news to the poor. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for your grace that has poured out on us. We thank you that you in to your table and have given us the invitation to your feast. May we hear today your words of instruction to us on those that we should seek 
and on who we must be if we are to answer your invitation to us. We pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Luke's Gospel is very focused on a few major themes, and he's not subtle about it. He starts off in the very beginning with Mary singing a song that says, the rulers will be cast down from their thrones and the wealth of the rich will be scattered. And then when Jesus begins his ministry, this is shared amongst the Gospels. He's in the synagogue. He steps up and he takes the scroll of Isaiah that we heard this morning and says, I have come to being release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to denounce the time had come when the Lord would save his people. I have come to bring good news to the poor. The story of Jesus' coming and ministry For Luke, he focuses in on good news to the poor. And he talks to us a lot with these very convicting words. This passage that we often call counting the cost of discipleship, where he says such terrifying things. Other translations say anyone who does not hate Father, mother, sister, brother. Anyone who does not give everything they own cannot be my disciple or cannot follow me. These are challenging words of Jesus. Giving everything is a tall order. But what about these stories of eating together? Jesus spends a lot of time eating with people. Perhaps you have heard the phrase, he ate with tax collectors and sinners. There is a story earlier in the book of Luke about a man named Levi You might know him as Matthew. He wrote another one of these Gospels. And when Jesus calls him, he gives up everything. He throws a banquet where Jesus eats with the poor and tells a story about worn-out wineskins. Kind of sounds like some stories of a banquet, of a call to discipleship of an invitation to the poor, and of salt that has become unsalty, doesn't it? We have this beautiful pairing of stories for Jesus that Jesus gives us today. We have the parable of dinner guests, the parable of the great banquet, the parable of the tower and the king, And then what happens next is the parables of the lost sheep, coin, and the prodigal son. Jesus is giving a structured, or Luke is presenting a structured interpretation of his time learning about Jesus. For him, the words of Jesus that are in these parables all tie together, which was news to me. I was shocked when I began reading the passage that I knew about counting the cost and realized I always thought this stood on its own. Maybe I was the foolish one, but it turns out the people who gave us the words of the Lord are pretty clever. 
these sets of parables mark in a couplet. If you didn't know, I'm a literature minor. I am about 75% Bible nerd and like 25% T.S. Eliot nerd. And you can argue about whether or not in some ways those are the same thing. I've done that before. But I love poetry and literature. And so I was looking at these and and I began to see a, a structure called a couplet. A pairing of two things that mirror one another These parables begin with a parable of the guest. This is an instruction given towards the listeners in which Jesus speaks about the invitation. We then hear a parable about a banquet, an example of how to behave that speaks about our response to God's invitation. And then we have this counting, this, this carry your cross story where once again it is instructive, but we've flipped and it is about our response to God. And then we hear the parables of the lost where Jesus offers examples of invitations to the lost. And they all center around the same thing. The other part of the calling of Levi is that Jesus says to the Pharisees there, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. It is not the loss, it is not the found who are sought, but the lost. So we see these four examples of invitation and response. First, Jesus tells us to welcome those into our tables into our meals who are not going to be able to pay us back. If you were to invite someone to dinner, particularly in that period of time, and you said, eat with me at my table, my table where my family eats, you were making them family. If you were to invite the poor and the sinner and the lame and the blind to eat with you, you were choosing those who were so far outside of the in crowd to be your family. You were doing the opposite of shaking hands and making connections. You were doing the opposite of getting distinguished honor from those who could give you things in return. And then in the banquet, we hear again another meal that focuses on the behavior of the invited. The owner of the person organizing the banquet through the best parties But instead of filling it with the most beautiful people, like our prince from Beauty and the Beast, those people are too busy with their own lives, their own possessions, and their own schedules to answer the call to the table, to come in. But the poor those who no one else would dream of bringing in, they are ready to come when they are called. And then to us directly, Jesus says, now which one are you going to be? Are you going to be the rich who are occupied with their own stories? Or are you going to choose me over your family obligations? 
Are you going to take upon a symbol of political shame? Because the cross to them wasn't a matter of dying and resurrection yet. It was a matter of being shamed and humiliated by the political power of the world. Being on the outside of those who are in charge. And then he says, are you willing to give up the other things that hold your attention? Everything that demands your focus to respond to this call. And then he finally turns back to these Pharisees and says, now, here's who God seeks out. He's not come to find you. You're already a part of us. You're already in the people of God. This isn't about you. And you are chasing and looking for people who are like you, who you are comfortable with, who will pay you back, invite you to their meals, who will bring you respect and honor. You are looking for the sheep who are loyal. You are bringing attention to the brother who never left. But you should be seeking the lost. The one who has squandered everything and who is eating with the pigs. I think that when I read the parable of the prodigal son at the end of this extended story about invitation and receiving a call, a call to follow, I think I see in us this group of people that Jesus is talking about This group of people who are saltless salt. You see, those people who are inside, they are the poor and the lame and the paralyzed. But those who are not salty, they are the ones who are outside the banquet. Are you going to welcome the invitation inside or out? And we have this brother, this brother who hears the music and asks what's going on and says, your brother, the poor one, the one who had lost everything, who had been humiliated by eating the leftovers of the leftovers. And he scoffed and did not welcome him in. Then the brother was invited to the feast to celebrate his return of the lost son. And he was too proud and too occupied with the fact that he had always been there to answer his father's invitation. But you know who did? The servants and day laborers joined in and celebrated. And instead of welcoming the one who had nothing left to offer the family, the son complained, I've been here the whole time, and you haven't given me more. But all the fathers had was his. The brother gives us an example of what it is to be a saltless one. And the brother, when the father meets him, the story ends there. We're not told that the brother changes his mind and comes back in. He's left outside the banquet. So when we come back to this idea of considering the cost of this invitation and response to follow, 
there are two examples sandwiched in the middle of these four parables. There was one man who built a tower, and he went off imagining that he had enough money to finish it, but he didn't. He was not able to complete it. Now, there's this really interesting word in Greek that is very important to our doctrine of sanctification. It is teleo or teleos, and it means maturity, completion, to realize a purpose. We often use that word to speak of holiness. That we have, li- have gone to God's purpose for ourselves. We have reached maturity. This person did not take the time to think about what it would be to follow Jesus. And then we have the king. And it's interesting, we name the passage after the first story. But these stories are to counterbalance each other. The the king is an example of what we ought to do. And it has nothing to do with price. The king has to think, can I finish what I've started? Can I win this war? Jesus says that king sought counsel. And recognizing he could not, He sent one to represent him and ask for peace. The word for peace there is the same word that they use in the Greek Old Testament for shalom. A word that we know and use to refer to the wholeness that God brings when he brings us to salvation. So you have a person who did not take the time to think, what does it mean to answer this invitation? He started following Jesus. There wasn't a price to be paid to become a disciple. There was a cost of what it meant to be a disciple, and he fell short because he couldn't finish the tower on his own. He could not complete the work of discipleship. And then there is a king who cannot win the war. Both of them incapable on their own of accomplishing the task that Jesus is comparing to following him. The difference is the response. One walks away incomplete to his shame because he didn't think about whether he could do it on his own. And the king who says, I need to ask to send someone to seek peace with me. Following Christ, answering this invitation to this banquet, is recognizing that we can't pay the cost. It's recognizing that to follow Jesus is to do something that requires us to give up the trappings of the world. It requires us to become the people who hear the mission of Jesus. Good news to the poor. Luke mentions salt losing its saltiness. So does Matthew, the man whose example is mirrored in these parables. He puts that passage with the Beatitudes, where he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, the meek the persecuted, the hungry. This story of Jesus is a story 
of reversing the structure that Rome was telling everyone to live by. Seek honor, repayment, and wealth. And saying, no, if you are a follower of me, you are going to give up honor, not be repaid, and give up what you have. Following Jesus means rejecting the structures of honor and power and wealth of the world, like Mary said, and living Jesus' mission of good news to the poor. We are invited, and we are to invite to this table. Those who were on the outside are to be brought in. They will answer the call. And so we come to an important part of our service. Our table. Every time we gather, we come to a banquet. And there is an invitation to this table. And a question is posed to you. Are you too busy with everything else in your life to come to this table and seek grace? Are you too occupied with what you have to admit that you need someone to bring you peace? Or do you think you'll build this tower on your own? And who will you rub elbows with at this table? Will it be people who pay you back? Or will it be people that have nothing to offer you? Will it be the insider? Or will you join Jesus at the table of outsiders? And so, we come to the table of the Lord today, where the Lord Jesus did on the night he was betrayed, take bread, and he does what he always does when we see him hold bread in his hands. He breaks it. He gives it to the disciples. He blesses it in prayer. And then he says, take and eat, for this is my body. And then he takes this cup and he lifts it up and says, this cup is something new. It's a different way of doing things. It's the covenant of my blood which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink in remembrance of me. And so Lord has invited us to this table. I would like to, at this time, invite our ushers to come up to prepare to receive the elements. I invite you to pray with me now over this banquet that we are offered. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who proclaimed good news to the poor. We thank you that you have opened your table to us, those who were on the outside and have invited us into this transforming and resurrection grace. So as your son who preached good news to the poor, we are the poor who have come. We invite them, the poor, to our table. Lord, would you pour out your spirit on those who have answered the invitation today, so that by your spirit... As we receive this body and blood of Christ, we may reciprocate the invitation and be the body and blood of Christ for all the world so that we together may feast at your heavenly banquet. And let us now together proclaim the mystery of our faith. For Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here on on these gifts of cup, bread and cup, and make them be for us the body and blood that we may be for the world the body of blood of Jesus Christ. Make us one with each other, one with your Son, and one with your Spirit in ministry to invite all the world until you come in final victory. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. O church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the wind See that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. As an army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. To war, to love the captive soul, but to rage against the captor, and with the sword that makes the wounded whole, we will fight with faith and valor. When faced with trials on every side, we know. cross where love and mercy meet as the son of God is stricken and see his foes lie crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror has risen and as the stone is rolled away and Christ emerges And now as Christ broke bread and lifted cup with his disciples, let us together at the banquet for the poor and the lost have the bread, the the body of Christ broken for you. Take, eat, and be thankful. And the blood of Christ which is poured out for you. 
drink in remembrance of our Lord and be thankful. And now I would invite you all to stand and receive this blessing in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. As you go from this place to which you have been invited in, extend the same invitation to those you would never suspect, but who answer the call to follow no matter what it takes. Go in his peace. You are loved. Sing the doxology to you. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Just f-